Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Chocolate Yule Log. That's right, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say many home cooks would not attempt something like this because they assume it involves many components, lots of steps, and super advanced culinary skills to make. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that only two out of those three things are true. Because while this does require a little bit of time and effort, the techniques involved in making this Bush de Noel are actually quite simple, especially if you have a video that shows you how to do them. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our filling. And by filling, I mean very simple buttercream frosting. And for that, we're gonna combine some powdered sugar with a little bit of butter, as well as a touch of cocoa powder, which is high quality and unsweetened, by the way. Then we'll also add a pinch of salt, as well as a splash of coffee liqueur and or extract. And what we'll do is take that over to our mixer and whip it up until it's very light and fluffy. And if your butter's nice and soft, this is gonna happen very quickly and easily. But if it's still kind of firm and cold like mine, it's not. It's gonna stick in the middle of the whisk and really do nothing. And you'll have to stop and work it with your spatula and do that a few times until it starts to soften up, which I won't make you watch. But either way, we're gonna whip that on high speed until like I said, it's very, very light and fluffy. And hopefully it looks a little something like this. And while we could certainly use this as is, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this into a bowl and add one more ingredient, a nice big spoon of mascarpone cheese, which is a wonderfully rich Italian style cream cheese. And we'll go ahead and use our spatula to mix that in. And that's gonna add a really nice little bit of tanginess in the background, as well as sort of lighten this up a little. And by the way, you know your frosting is pretty decadent when you're lightening it up with mascarpone. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that in and then simply set that aside until we need it. At which point we'll move on to one more thing we need to do ahead of time. And that would be to line a baking sheet with some parchment paper and brush it generously with melted butter. And I didn't show it, but a little tip, put a little butter on the pan before you put the paper down, which will sort of hold it in place while you brush it. And then once our pan is prepped, we can move on to this very simple chocolate sponge cake recipe, which we will start by combining our dry ingredients, which includes cocoa powder, some salt, and just a little bit of all-purpose flour. And what we'll do is go ahead and take a whisk and give that a good mix, even though technically we really should sift this. Okay, and the reason is sometimes you get little clumps or lumps of cocoa that you really wanna have broken up before you add it to the wet stuff. And while whisking this together for a minute generally does break those up, I would say sifting does do a better job. But either way, once that's been accomplished, we can move on to our wet ingredients, which are exactly five large eggs that are room temperature. Very important, you do not use cold eggs for this. And then to the eggs, we'll add a little touch of sugar. And what we're gonna do here is whip these on high speed for a few minutes until they turn very, very pale, very thick, and very fluffy. Which is why, if possible, you really do wanna use an electric mixer for this. I mean, sure, you can do it by hand, but it's gonna take a long time and a lot of effort. Although the good news is you'll probably burn more calories than the average serving of cake. But either way, we're gonna whip those eggs and sugar until they get really thick and fluffy and look exactly like this. All right, you see that? Do not stop before it looks like this. And then what we'll do at this point is add our dry ingredients in two additions. Okay, we'll transfer in about half. In this first addition, we're just gonna mix for a few seconds. All right, not on high speed. On one of your lower settings, just until it starts to mix in. Oh, and if you're gonna to forget to put in your vanilla extract, this would be the point you would forget to do that. So yes, I should have added that here, and I'll mention that in the blog post. But anyway, as I was saying, we're gonna mix that first half in for a few seconds. And even though it's not totally mixed in, we're gonna stop and add the rest. And then we'll start that on low for a few seconds before turning it up to a higher speed for a few more seconds. At which point we're gonna stop, and it's still not all mixed in. But again, that's not a problem, because we're gonna finish this by hand. Okay, just pull off that whisk, and give that a few stirs manually, and then give it a check. And it was close, but I decided to give it a few more stirs. And this way we can make sure we're incorporating everything around the edges and along the bottom without knocking out too much of that foaminess, which could possibly happen if we mix this all the way with the machine. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our baking sheet. And we'll use a spatula to spread that out as even as we can. And please note, I'm not going all the way out to the edges. And you can if you want. It's not really a problem, but I actually prefer to leave a little space on either end. And while those edges will be a little thinner once it bakes, I think that works out in our favor later on. But bottom line, we'll go ahead and transfer our batter on and spread it out. At which point we have to give this thing the old tappa tappa. 
Because while we do want all the millions and millions of little bubbles in there, we want to knock out the few hundred big bubbles. So we'll go ahead and bang that on the table a few times before we transfer it into the center of a 400 degree oven for just eight to 10 minutes or until it looks like what you're gonna see in a few seconds. And while that's baking, we're gonna have just enough time to take a clean kitchen towel and cover it with a nice dusting of powdered sugar. And you don't have to do the whole thing, just an area slightly bigger than a sheet pan. And you're gonna see why in just a minute. And we'll go ahead and pull out our cake, which after about eight to 10 minutes should look like this. And what we'll wanna do is let this cool down for a couple minutes while we do a few things. One would be to go around with a knife, making sure it's not stuck to the pan. And if it is, just cut it loose. And the other would be to dust the top of this with a little bit of powdered sugar. And what the powdered sugar is doing on the cake and the towel is preventing this very sticky sponge from sticking. And by the way, you can, if you want, use cocoa, but that's more expensive than powdered sugar. So I'm going with this. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and give this one last check with a spatula to make sure it's not sticking anywhere. Because the next step is to flop this over onto our towel, which is my preferred method. Right, some people like to cover it with a towel and then flip it over. But as long as you have this lined up and you do it quick, it's gonna be fine. And then we'll remove the pan and carefully peel off our parchment paper. And hopefully none of it sticks, even though almost always a little bit does. But that's fine because you get to scrape that off with your fingernail and eat it. And get a little sneak preview. And then before we roll this up in our towel, we wanna to give it one more dusting of powdered sugar. Because I can't stress enough how much this stuff loves to stick to anything. Plastic, metal, wood, even a towel. So we'll go ahead and dust that again. And then very carefully, very gently roll this up. And because this is such a delicate sponge, we don't want to be pressing down as we do this. Okay, so use a very light touch. And we'll go ahead and roll that all the way. And then all we're going to do is let this cool down rolled up like this for 15 minutes. And by doing this, the sponge is going to have the memory of this roll so that when we unroll it and spread our filling on, we can roll it back up without it cracking. So this is a very key step. And as you can see, some of the sugar actually stuck to the towel, but none of the cake did. So mission accomplished. And at this point, we can go ahead and transfer on our filling and spread it out evenly. And to make that a little easier, what we like to do is dollop our filling here and there so that it's equally distributed before we start spreading it around. Okay, versus dumping it all in one spot and then trying to spread it all out evenly. And by the way, I thought I was being really judicious with the buttercream here, but as it turned out, I put on a lot more than I realized, as you'll see in the final shots, which is great if you're one of these frosting people, but I'm more of a cake guy. Anyway, the point is you spread on as much as you want. I mean, you are after all the me of this edible tree. So we will leave this cake to frosting ratio up to you. And then once we have that all spread out, we can go ahead and carefully start to roll this up. And the first few inches are the hardest. And if you need to use the towel to kind of help you along, go ahead. But once you get it started, you should be fine. And because our sponge has that quote unquote memory of being rolled, you shouldn't really have a problem with it cracking. And just like the first time we rolled it, don't press down too hard. Okay, use a nice light touch. And once we're happy with how that's rolled and shaped, We'll go ahead and dust the top with a little more sugar, because why not? And then once that's dusted, we'll go ahead and wrap it in plastic. And please accept my apologies for speeding this up, which I hate to do. But I didn't have enough interesting things to say to fill up the time. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and wrap that in plastic. And I'm doing two layers, even though I'm only showing one. And once wrapped, we're going to transfer that into the fridge for a few hours or until it's completely chilled before we apply our bark. So we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge. And while it's in there, I'm gonna go ahead and make my chocolate ganache, which is nothing more than dark chocolate chips with hot boiling cream poured over it. And we'll let that sit like that for about a minute before stirring it together. And as usual with chocolate ganache, it looks terrible, but then you keep stirring and eventually it looks awesome. And as that cools, it's gonna thicken up, as you can see right here with a little bit I had left over from a different batch. And to me, that makes one of the great chocolate frostings of all time. And as you're about to see, makes a very beautiful bark. And then, assuming our chocolate Yule log is completely chilled, we'll go ahead and pull that out and unwrap it. And we'll cut a little piece off the end, officially to kind of clean it up, but unofficially because I wanted to taste it. And it was amazing. And by the way, I didn't like what that serrated edge was doing. So I switched to a straight edge knife. 
And what we want to do is make an angled cut about three inches or so from the end. Because what's going to happen once we transfer the main log to a parchment lined sheet pan is that we're going to apply a little bit of buttercream to that cut piece and sort of stick or press that onto the side to make it look like there's another branch coming off our log. And while this step's optional, I think it really does make for a much more impressive presentation. And then once that was set, I took the rest of my leftover ganache and used that to cover where that branch attached. And as far as working with the ganache, you can let it get really stiff like this. And as long as it's still spreadable, it's fine. But as you can see, as I continue covering this with the fresh ganache, I find this looser, runnier stuff a little easier to work with. All right, as long as it's not too runny. Okay, we don't want this running all over our pan. But either way, we're gonna go ahead and apply a nice layer of our ganache over the entire log, all right, all the way down to the bottom. But of course, we will leave the front and side uncovered so we can see our beautiful swirl. And people can see that our log is roughly five to six years old. And just by spreading the ganache over like this, you're gonna get a fairly bark-like appearance. But for our final bark details, what we wanna do is pop this in the fridge for about 15 or 20 minutes until that stuff firms up a little bit. And then using the tip of the knife, we can really give this thing the texture of actual bark. Okay, just drag that tip through all over. And since real bark is kind of rough and irregular, there's really no way to screw this up. But personally, I think the rougher and more irregular, the better. And yes, this is exactly as fun as it looks, which is super fun. And then once we have those final details done, what we have to do again is chill this thoroughly before serving. So we'll pop that back into the fridge until we're ready to serve, at which point we'll transfer that onto some kind of attractive serving platter or a gorgeous piece of marble and proceed to dust the top a little bit of cocoa as well as a little powdered sugar to make it look even more like an old log that has a little bit of frost. And while your guests will be very, very impressed if you serve it just like this, if you wanted to, you could also add some gingerbread dirt as well as some meringue mushrooms which are super easy to make. And maybe I'll show you how to do those. And for a final touch, maybe we'll add a few rosemary sprigs here and there to complete the scene. And that's it, our chocolate Yule log is done. And it totally looks like we knew what we were doing. I mean, if this doesn't impress your friends and family, I'm sorry, but your friends and family are too hard to impress. But just looking amazing is not enough. This also should taste incredible. So I went ahead and cut a slice to try it out. And I play that up next to some meringue mushrooms, which are never not adorable. And despite it having a little too much buttercream for my taste, it really was fantastic. All right, that almost flourless chocolate sponge is just sweet enough and still very moist and paired perfectly with that very simple mocha buttercream. So above and beyond its show-stopping appearance, I really did enjoy the taste and texture of this as well. Oh, and I should mention, before this gets rolled up, you can actually soak the sponge with a little bit of liqueur or liquor, just like I'm doing here with some Kahlua. So if you did want to adult this up, you can brush or drizzle that onto the sponge itself, or just add some on when you slice it and serve it like this. So just a little bonus tip for how to help achieve those rosy Santa Claus-like cheeks. But anyway, I'll finish the rest of this slice off later. Right now I have to take a little mushroom break. Make that a mushrooms break. But anyway, that's it. My method for making the classic holiday bush de Noel. Like I said in the intro, not really that hard to make, although it does take a fair amount of time and effort. But when you're done, it looks like it takes a lot of time and effort, which really is the point of a special holiday dessert. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with panettone. That's right, I'm very excited to show you my very first attempt ever at making panettone. And I'll admit to being a little bit intimidated because from what I read, this is supposed to be one of the hardest breads in the world to make. In fact, one article compared it to climbing Mount Everest, which sounds a little dramatic. I mean, I don't think there's dozens of people that die each year making this bread, or at least not suddenly. But anyway, as you'll see, this came out really well. So this is either easier than people say, or I had a good amount of beginner's luck. But either way, let's go ahead and get started by starting the starter, which we're gonna need to make the day before. And we'll do that by mixing some flour and water together, to which we're gonna add some of our already made sourdough starter. And we'll go ahead and stir that together. 
And I hope you have some of that in your fridge. But if you don't, in the blog post, I'm going to tell you how to make it without it. And what we'll do once that's mixed is go ahead and cover it and just leave it out at room temp overnight. And not only is this mixture going to add some volume and flavor to our dough, it's also, believe it or not, going to help the finished loaf stay fresher longer. And then once that's set, we should move on to the other thing we should do the day before. And that would be to soak some chopped up dried fruit in some type of liquor. Okay, I'm using white rum. And as far as my fruit selection, I went with pineapple, cherry, and golden raisin. But there are so many other things you could use. So feel free to investigate other options. You are, after all, the James Comey of your panettone. But anyway, we'll go ahead and mix that up the night before and let that fruit absorb the booze, stirring occasionally. And then once those two things are set the next day, we can actually move on to making the dough, which will begin by dissolving a package of yeast in some very warm but not too hot water. And as usual, we'll let that sit for about 10 minutes before adding the following ingredients. All right, to that we're gonna add a couple eggs, as well as some white sugar. We'll also toss in a spoon of pure vanilla extract, as well as some freshly grated orange and lemon zest. And then for whatever reason, I decide to take a whisk and give this a mix before adding our starter and flour. You probably don't have to, but it's too late now. And once I had done that, I went ahead and grabbed my starter from the day before, which looked beautifully bubbly and smelled amazing. And what we'll do is give that a stir and dump it into our mixing bowl. And like I said, if you don't have some sourdough starter, don't worry. I'll tell you in the blog post how to make a cheater version. But anyway, we'll go ahead and dump that in, at which point we'll go ahead and finish this off by adding our flour. And I'm just using all purpose here, although some recipes do call for bread flour. And at this point, we'll grab our dough hook and start kneading this in our stand mixer. Although as soon as I lowered that hook in, I realized I forgot the salt. So I stopped and added it because you never, ever want to forget the salt. And then what we're going to do is let this knead for a long time, like for 10 minutes or so, until we've achieved a very, very smooth, very, very elastic dough. And early on, if you need to stop it and scrape down the sides, go ahead. But like I said, we'll let this knead for about 10 minutes until we've created something that looks like this. All right, like I said, very smooth and very elastic. And if we pull that dough with our spatula, it should sort of snap back into place. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and add our room temperature butter. Okay, ice cold's not gonna work here. Make sure it's room temp. And we're gonna need that for another five minutes or so, or until that butter is completely mixed in. And we've created, once again, a very smooth, very elastic, somewhat shiny dough. And once again, you might have to turn off the machine a couple times and scrape down the sides until it all starts to come together. So this is what mine looked like about five minutes later. So yes, we are talking about a very, very soft, somewhat sticky dough here which is probably one of the reasons people say this is a hard bread to make. All right, generally people are scared of really soft doughs, but don't be, you'll be fine. But anyway, let me go ahead and transfer that onto my work surface so you can get a better look. And then what I did using some slightly damp fingers, as well as the help of my bench scraper, is sort of wrestle and fold that a few times into some sort of dough ball shape. And by the way, one way you can tell if you've developed enough gluten is that you can stretch it so thin you can see light through it without it tearing which they call the window pane test, because you're supposed to stretch it out between two figures in front of a window. But I'm not going to, because I can tell just by pinching and stretching like this. And then what I did is transfer that back into my bowl that I didn't even bother cleaning out. I usually do, but I didn't feel like it. And then what we'll do is cover that and let it rise until doubled, which is gonna take a while. Okay, these rich doughs rise pretty slowly. So mine actually took about three hours, which was totally worth the wait, if for no other reason just the feeling you get when you punch it down. Man, that feels good. And what we'll want to do at this point is transfer that back onto our table. And then once deflated, again using some damp fingers in our bench scraper, we will fold that back into some kind of ballish shape. Because what we're going to need to do is transfer this into a plastic bag and refrigerate it overnight. Oh yeah, we're talking about a three-day bread here. All right, so if you want this bread today, you have to start it two days ago. But anyway, trust me, it'll be worth the wait. So I went ahead and transferred that into a plastic bag and popped it in the fridge overnight. And by the way, we're not just doing this step to make you wait for nothing. All right, this overnight fermentation in the fridge really does improve the flavor and probably texture. So I did pop mine in the fridge overnight and then pulled it out the next morning, at which point it looked like this. And what we'll do is go ahead and remove the bag. I just rip it open. I know some of you would wash this and reuse it, but I don't swing that way. And then what we'll do is go ahead and press this out into some sort of square rectangle shape. And because the dough is nice and cold and that butter is stiffened up, it's a little easier to work with. And then once I get it to about this flatness, 
I'll sprinkle it with a little bit of flour and then roll it out a little thinner with my rolling pin. And the whole reason we're doing this is that so we can scatter over our boozy dried fruit and then roll this up. And theoretically, that way, all our fruit will be evenly distributed. So I went ahead and applied my dried fruit to the surface, which by now had absorbed all that rum. But I ended up not using it all because as I was doing this, I was thinking, man, this is like way too much fruit. So I actually only ended up using about three quarters of it, which as you'll see in the final shots, probably wasn't the best idea. I probably should have used it all. But anyway, once that was spread out, like I said, we'll go ahead and roll the dough up nice and tight. And please accept my apologies for the blurriness. See, that's one of the reasons I've never won an Oscar. So let's fast forward. And then once that's been rolled up, I went ahead and rolled both ends up towards the middle, attempting somehow to get it back into some kind of round shape. And if at all possible, try to end up with a good amount of dough on the top. Okay, so I sort of worked that around until, like I said, I ended up with some kind of smooth dough over the top. And then once that's been accomplished, what we need to do is transfer this into a paper panettone mold, which come in this shape, the shorter, wider one, as well as a tall, skinny version. And yes, of course, in the blog post, I'm going to tell you where to find those. And then what we'll need to do is cover this and let it rise until it's at least two thirds of the way up the sides, which because we're starting with cold dough, is going to take like three or four hours. But don't go by time. Go until it looks like this. And by the way, a few hours in, I took off the plastic because it was touching the top. It was kind of sticking and I got scared. You can see the marker left right there. But anyway, the point is let your dough proof in this mold until it looks like this. At which point we will carefully brush the surface with an egg wash, which is one egg beaten with a splash of water. And then once that's been applied to the entire surface, we will take a razor or a sharp knife and cut across into the top about a quarter to a half inch down, which is not just done to make this look really cool, although that's a big part of it. We actually need to do that so it rises properly and we achieve that beautiful signature dome shape. So we'll go ahead and slice the top just like that. And then our last official act before this goes in the oven is to place a small piece of butter right in the middle, which is probably more traditional than practical, since I doubt that's gonna make much of a difference, but do it anyway. And that's it, we are finally ready to bake. So we will go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes, or until it looks like this, which would be beautifully browned and spectacularly gorgeous. I mean, look at that. That was so beautiful. I didn't even really care how this tasted. And then if you're thinking, hey, this is probably ready to eat right now. Well, unfortunately, you could not be more wrong. We actually need to let this cool for two hours upside down. Oh yeah, you heard me which is why I'm gonna poke in two skewers on either side and then flip this over onto a panettone cooling hole, which I had cut into my table. But if you don't happen to have access to a panettone cooling hole, you can just flip this over on top of a Dutch oven or a stock pot or something like that. And by cooling this upside down, there's not gonna be any collapsing and it's gonna help us retain a beautiful light texture. So take that gravity. And then after somehow waiting for a couple hours for this to fully cool, we will go ahead and pull out those skewers and finally be able to cut in and see how we did. So I went ahead and sliced out a wedge. And like I said, this looks so magnificent. I really didn't care how it tasted, but I'm very happy to report for a first attempt, it tasted really good, which didn't really surprise me. What did surprise me was how amazing the texture was for a first attempt. Okay, it was rich and buttery, but it was just impossibly light and airy. The only major surprise was where the heck did all that fruit go? I thought I had way too much and ended up thinking I didn't have enough. But anyway, besides that, I was extremely happy and went ahead and cut another piece so I could try some with butter, which is even a better way to enjoy this. And for whatever reason, I found this shape to be more enjoyable than the wedge. So I'm gonna suggest you cut yours in half and then down into slices. And while this bread was great plain and even better spread with butter, I'm gonna show you a third and what I consider ultimate way to enjoy this. And that would be lightly toasted with butter. Okay, that really is the ultimate way to enjoy this bread, preferably with a nice hot cup of coffee. But anyway, that's it, my first attempt at panettone. Yes, it took three days and many hours, but as far as actual work involved, there really wasn't that much. And like I said, I was really happy with how this came out. Although next time I am gonna add all the fruit and maybe make a few tweaks, which you'll read about on the blog post. But bottom line, this was not even close to as hard as people made it out to be. So for that reason and many others, 
I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with salted caramel custard. That's right, say hello to your new favorite dessert. And of course, I'm basing that statement on the assumption that you like beautiful, easy to make, and extraordinarily delicious desserts. But if that is the case, I feel pretty confident about my prediction. And by the way, if you're a fan of the creme caramel, this is like having an entire ramekin full of the best parts of that dessert. So I'm very much looking forward to showing you how to put this together. And we're going to start off by separating some eggs. Because for this, we're going to need nine large egg yolks. And when I'm doing this many, my favorite method is to simply crack the egg into my hand and letting the white drip between my fingers into a bowl below. And of course, you could use the standard shell-to-shell -shell method. But like I said, when I'm doing a bunch of them, I do prefer this method. Plus, if someone's watching, it looks super cool and almost as if you know what you're doing. But anyway, one way or another, we're going to separate nine large egg yolks. And of course, we're going to save those whites for another recipe, quite possibly involving a meringue. And then once our eggs are set, we can head over to the stove to start our caramel. So we're going to put some white granulated sugar in a heavy bottom saucepan and place that over medium heat and cook it until we have a nice dark amber caramel. And the method we're using here is called a dry caramel. So we're not going to add any water and we're definitely not going to stir it. We're simply going to leave it on the heat, observing carefully, and eventually you'll see the sugar starting to melt around the edges and start to turn color. And it is going to be tempting to stir it, but don't. Just let it go until it starts to darken and bubble around the outside like this. And at that point, we'll start to shake and swirl the pan until all that sugar is dissolved. Or is it melted? I think it's melted. But anyway, the point is not to stir it. Just keep moving it like this until eventually we have a beautiful, clear, dark amber caramel. And by the way, I told you to use medium heat, but I'll be honest, I use about medium high. And that's because I made like a thousand of these and the medium high will accomplish this a little faster. So if you do want to try this with a little higher heat, go ahead. Sugar's pretty cheap. So if you do go too far and burn it, you can always start over. But anyway, like I said, we're not going to stir. We're just going to keep swirling the pan like that. And eventually all that sugar is going to melt and your mixture should look like this. And then as soon as this has been accomplished, we're going to very quickly and very carefully whisk in two cups of cream. And be careful, it's going to bubble up, but you should be fine. Just keep pouring and stirring. And what's going to happen is you're going to think you wrecked this. Because that caramel we just made is going to seize up and basically turn into strands of hard rock candy. But fear not, just keep stirring. And as that cream heats up, all that stuff's going to melt off your whisk and dissolve into the cream. And not to pat myself on the back, but one of the major advantages of a video is that you're able to see everything's going to turn out all right. If people were following a written recipe only and saw something that looked like this, they would probably stop and throw it away and make something else. But as you can see, if you just keep stirring, that mixture is going to come back up to temperature and that sugar is going to dissolve right into the cream. And one thing I wanted to mention, a lot of chefs throw a chunk of butter into this. But I don't. The cream here is like 35% butter fat, so I don't think it's necessary. Said the man who just posted a sausage recipe finished with a butter sauce. But regardless, and as soon as that sugar dissolves fully into the mixture, we're going to turn off the heat and add the final ingredients. So we will turn off the flame and we'll toss in a half a teaspoon of kosher salt, which by the way is definitely not the same thing as a half a teaspoon of fine salt. That would be too salty. In fact, I really need to do that video explaining the different types of salt. But anyway, we're going to whisk in a touch of salt, as well as some pure vanilla extract. And then last but not least, one cup of cold milk. And while this mixture is still very hot, by adding that cup of cold milk, we've cooled that down enough so our egg yolks don't scramble when we add this in. Which, by the way, is the next step. So we will go ahead and add this hot mixture to our egg yolks, but to play it safe, we'll start off slow. So we will add one ladle and whisk that in. And once that's been incorporated, we can add another. And then after a couple ladles full, we are safe to add the rest. And I should mention, a lot of recipes say to strain this, in case there's any little particles of sugar or whatever. But you know what I like much less than tiny particles of sugar? Cleaning a strainer. So I don't strain, and don't think you need to either. And as soon as we have everything mixed together, we are ready to fill our ramekins. So I have six ramekins placed in a baking dish, and we'll go ahead and we'll divide our mixture evenly among them. And no, you do not need to butter those ramekins. In fact, don't butter those ramekins. Totally unnecessary. And then once those are evenly filled, we have to do one very important thing before this goes in the oven. We want to pour in enough water to go halfway up the ramekin. 
And I'm just using hot tap water, by the way. So I'm going to pour that in and make sure it's coming up, like I said, about halfway. And at that point, these are ready to bake. So let's go ahead and pop those in the center of a 300 degree oven for about 45 to 60 minutes or until they look like this and the custard is just set. And what I mean by just set is this. If we give that ramekin a little wiggle, everything should jiggle as one mass. Okay, if the center's kind of jiggling at a different rate than the outsides, and it still seems a little loose, put it back in for a couple more minutes. But assuming your custards have been cooked perfectly, what we'll do is carefully remove those from the baking dish and let those cool completely on a rack. And what we want to do is cool these down to room temp before we wrap them up and chill them thoroughly. Do not, under any circumstances, eat two of them at room temperature because they're just not as good. So let them cool down to room temp, and then we'll wrap those in plastic, and then chill those for at least an hour until ice cold. Okay, the colder the better. And then once those are fully chilled, we can go ahead and serve those up with the traditional sprinkling of large flaky sea salt, and our salted caramel custards are done. And just looking fantastic. I think the top of a cooked salted caramel custard is maybe my favorite color in the world. It's kind of like a combo between camel hair and pumpkin. And by the way, camel hair pumpkin, worst custard flavor ever. But anyway, just absolutely stunning to look at and even more delicious to eat. So let me grab a spoon and dig in. And as far as the texture goes, we do want something soft, smooth, and custardy, but we do want it firm enough to hold those nice sharp lines when we dig in with the spoon. All right, there's a very old culinary saying that I just made up. When it comes to a baked custard, they shouldn't droop when you scoop. So I thought this was spot on. And then as far as the taste, you've heard me say a million times before, I'm not a big dessert person. And that's mostly because I don't like really sweet things. But this really isn't overly sweet. Okay, when you caramelize sugar, it does take some of the sweetness away. So to summarize, I love everything about this recipe. And I know a lot of home cooks get flustered by custard. But hopefully, as you saw in this video, it's really not that hard. And the results are, well, you saw the results incredible. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Portuguese custard tarts. That's right, I'm going to show you how to make pastes de nata, which are truly one of the world's most amazing pastries, and believe it or not, invented by Portuguese monks many, many centuries ago. Which kind of makes sense. I mean, if you're going to take a vow of poverty and a vow of chastity, that is going to free up a lot of time to practice your pastry skills. And man, did they perfect this recipe. So with a very sincere thank you to the Hieronymites, let's go ahead and get started with what is basically the simplest dough you can make, which consists of nothing more than flour, some salt, and some water. And then what we'll do is grab a wooden spoon and give this a mix until it just comes together and pulls away from the bowl. And fair warning, this is going to be a very wet and sticky dough. And once those three ingredients come together and look a little something like this, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto a very well-floured surface. And we'll dust a little more flour over the top. And then we're just going to give it a few seconds of kneading and circular rubbing until we get that into some kind of semi-rounded shape. And once that's been accomplished, we will dust on a little more flour. And then we'll cover that with our bowl and let it rest about 15 or 20 minutes. And no peaking. And all we're doing is letting the dough relax a little bit so it's a little easier to work with. And then what we'll do after about 15 or 20 minutes is uncover it. And then using as much flour as necessary, we're going to press, roll, and stretch this into a square about an eighth of an inch thick. And yes, this would be a lot easier to work with if the dough was drier, but you're just not going to get that same final effect. So even though it's going to be a little annoying to work with, we really do want to start with a very sticky dough. And then what we're going to do once we have that rolled and stretched out into a square is apply the only other ingredient here, some very, very soft spreadable butter. And what we want to do is apply exactly one third of our butter to exactly two thirds of this square. And as we're spreading this, we're going to try to leave about an inch of the outside edge unbuttered. And by the way, if you try doing this with butter that's not super soft, it won't work. Or you're going to end up tearing and pulling your dough, so make sure it's very, very soft and spreadable. And then what we'll do once we have two-thirds covered is take the third that's not buttered and flip that over. And then we will flip that other side over to complete our letter fold. And yes, I did flip that first side over too far. So I kind of had to stretch this to make it fit and tore it a little. But don't worry, it's all going to be fine. 
I just went ahead and squared that up the best I could. And then with the help of our bench scraper, we'll go ahead and turn the dough. And we will sprinkle on even more flour. And then we'll give that a flip. And then apply even more flour. Did I mention this was sticky? So do not be shy with the flour. And then once we do have that turned and floured, we'll go ahead and roll that out into a rectangular shape about an eighth of an inch thick. And if you're really good at this, you're not going to have any bubbles inside. Which is why I have bubbles. But as I kept rolling, those eventually got pressed out. But anyway, like I said, we'll go ahead and roll that out into a rectangle. And if you have to give it a little stretch here and there, don't be afraid. And then once that's set, we're going to repeat the thing we just did. Okay, we're going to take another third of our butter and spread it over two thirds of our surface. And then repeat the letter fold by taking the unbuttered third and folding that over. And then the opposite third over the top of that. And then we'll square it up and even it out the best we can. And then once that's been accomplished, before we apply the last of our butter, I'm going to go ahead and transfer this onto a baking sheet and pop this in the fridge for just about 10 minutes to chill that butter just a little bit. But I wouldn't go too much longer because we don't want it to get hard. So I popped it in there for about 10 minutes before pulling it back out for the final rolling. And good news, this is the last step. So we'll go ahead and flour that generously and roll that out into a square about an eighth of an inch thick, maybe a touch thicker. All right, let's say 3 16 And then what we'll do once that's been rolled out is apply the last third of our soft butter. And this time we can spread our butter all the way to the edges, except on the top edge. All right, at the top we're going to leave about an inch to an inch and a half unbuttered, because that's where we're going to seal our dough after we roll it. And what we'll do once that's all buttered is take a wet finger and ever so slightly moisten that unbuttered edge. And then to finish this up, instead of folding it, what we're going to do is slowly but surely roll this up from the bottom. All right, nice and tight, attempting to get this as uniformly shaped as possible. And while I'm doing this, I should mention, once we roll this up, we're going to have to wrap it and refrigerate it for a few hours, preferably overnight before we can start using it. So just a little time management heads up. And I actually did this exact recipe last night so I'd have one to work with. So yes, I did two of these rolls. Well, actually, technically three. Since I tested one of these rolls using pre-made puff pastry, which was a dismal failure. And I'll talk about that in the blog post. But anyway, we're going to continue rolling that all the way up to our unbuttered, slightly damp edge, which should hopefully seal this tube nicely. And then if we want, we can sprinkle on a little more flour and do some final shaping and evening out. But mine was pretty uniform, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap that in plastic. And like I said, pop that in the fridge, preferably overnight. And yes, in case you're wondering, you can absolutely freeze this dough. Just wrap it up nice and tight. And then let it thaw overnight in the fridge when you're ready to use it. But anyway, once our dough is set, we can move on to the custard, which is going to start with a simple syrup. So to the saucepan, we're going to add some white sugar, a splash of water, one cinnamon stick, and the peeled zest from one lemon. And make sure you wash your lemon in hot water first, in case it has any weird wax on the outside. And then once we have that all together, we're going to head to the stove, and we'll place that over medium heat. And we're going to want to bring this up to a boil. And by the way, you're not supposed to stir this. I do because I can't help myself, but it is totally unnecessary and you probably shouldn't. But anyway, all we need to do here is boil this until it reaches a temperature of 210 to 215 degrees Fahrenheit, or as a Portuguese monk would call it, 100 degrees Celsius. And as soon as that happens, we will turn it off. And there I go again, stirring it for no apparent reason. But anyway, we'll simply turn that off and reserve it until our final component is done. And that's going to be our custard base, which is going to consist of some flour, some salt, and some cold milk, which we're going to whisk for a few minutes before heading to the stove. And then what we're going to do once we've whisked that all together very, very thoroughly is place that over medium heat and cook it stirring until it thickens up. Oh, and I should mention I've actually streamlined this part of the recipe. Since classically the flour is mixed with a small amount of milk, and then the rest of the milk is heated, or tempered as we say, and then everything is whisked together. But I figured since we're going to strain it anyway, let's just take a chance. And it actually worked out fine. So yes, I guess I am sort of saying they've been doing it wrong for centuries in Portugal. But hey, at least now they know. But anyway, like I said, we're going to cook this over medium, whisking pretty much the whole time, until our mixture thickens up. At which point you should have something that looks very similar to this. And then what we're going to want to do is turn off the heat and let this sit for at least 10 minutes before whisking in our egg yolks. All right, if you're a super fast whisker, you could probably mix them in right away. But to play it safe, it's not a bad idea to wait about 10 minutes. 
And we'll go ahead and whisk those yolks in. And once we have those incorporated, we'll go ahead and finish this off by adding our sugar syrup. Plus, we will also add a spoon of vanilla extract. And I should mention the vanilla, cinnamon, and lemon should all be considered optional. All right, a lot of the so-called authentic recipes don't call for those. So you decide. I mean, you are for all the Hieronymite of what tastes right. But I like them, so I put them. And we'll give that all one final mix. And then, like I said, we are going to strain this, which is going to catch our lemon peel, cinnamon stick, and any undissolved lumps or chunks of flour, which I didn't really have any of. And the reason we're straining this into a measuring cup is because that's going to make it a lot easier to pour into our pastry shells. And forming those is going to be the next step. So we'll simply set our custard aside. And I'm going to go ahead and pull out the dough I made last night, which, because I wasn't filming, came out a little neater. But the exact same recipe. And we'll go ahead and unwrap that and cut a little bit off both ends. But don't discard that, in case we have to do a little bit of patching. And then we'll take our knife and score this into exactly 12 even pieces. And then let me go ahead and cut a couple of these, so you can get a good look at what's going on here. Okay, right here you should be able to see that swirl of dough and butter. And don't forget in the dough layer, there's actually layers of butter from the two folds we did earlier. So that's exactly what we want it to look like. And then to shape the dough, what we'll do is place one of these rolls at the bottom of each muffin cup. And we'll dip our thumb into some cold water. And then we'll push that right down into the center of that roll. And then we'll slowly but surely spread that out across the bottom. And then eventually up the sides. And it might not seem like you have enough dough, but you do. Okay, we really want to get this stuff nice and thin. And dipping your fingers in cold water really is key here. Since that's going to make it way easier to push and spread that dough up the sides. And one huge tip here, make sure you go at least an eighth of an inch up past the top. Okay, because what'll happen if you don't get these high enough is your custard is going to bake up over the top and run down the sides and it will burn and look black. So again, using wet fingers, make sure you smear and spread that stuff all the way up, not only to get it nice and thin, but like I said, so we have at least an eighth of an inch popping up above the edge. And if you want, you can do this step a little bit ahead and then just refrigerate that pan as is and fill it with the custard later. And then what we're going to do once our tart shells have been formed is go ahead and pour in our custard batter, but not all the way up. We only want to go about three quarters. All right, this custard is going to kind of puff up as it bakes. And if you fill them up too high, as I touched on earlier, it's going to spill over and get between the dough and the pan. And it definitely will burn since this is going to go in such a hot oven. So like I said, we'll just go three quarters of the way. And that's it. Once we have those filled, we will carefully transfer that into the center of a super hot 550 degree oven or whatever your highest setting is. And we will bake those for about 12 to 14 minutes or until our pastry is well browned and bubbling in butter and our custard is just barely set. So for ones done in a home oven, those are looking pretty nice. All right, in Portugal, the ovens are even hotter. So the top of the custards get even more caramelized and blistered. But you know what, these were looking just fine. And right here, you can get a great look at all that lamination, which is that layer of butter between the pastry. And while admittedly that took a little bit of work to do, that really is the secret behind these incredible tarts. And we're definitely going to want to let these cool a little bit before we try to pull one out. Although they are supposed to be served warm, so don't wait too long. So I waited a little bit and went ahead and popped one out. And as you can see, our pastry got beautifully browned. And if you look close, you can actually see the spiral from our rolled dough. But anyway, let me go ahead and bite in so I can taste and hear how we did. And yes, it really was that crispy and the perfect delivery system for that rich, creamy custard. Although it should have cooled a little bit more, since these really should be served warm and not hot. So I finished eating that one while I transferred the rest onto a rack to cool a little bit more. And after about 10 minutes, I plated one up, so I could take some pictures, but more importantly, eat another one. And the contrast here between that ultra crispy, flaky, buttery crust, and that soft, creamy custard subtly scented with cinnamon and lemon, is nothing like I've ever experienced eating any other pastry. I mean, it really is truly remarkable. And yes, there was a little bit of work involved in making that pastry. But when you finally get around to enjoy these, you will regret nothing. Except maybe not making a double batch. Okay, you should probably make 24 of these. But anyway, that's it. How I do Portuguese custard tarts. I'm not sure whether you have a bucket list or not. And if you do, whether it has a section for pastries. But if it does, stop whatever you're doing and add these to that list. So needless to say, I really do hope you give these a try soon. 
And you should definitely head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Russian honey cake. That's right, there are basically three different ways you can make this amazing cake. The hard way, the harder way, and the way we're going to do it the hardest way. But it's all going to be worth it, because once you're finished, you're going to be enjoying one of the most beautiful and delicious cakes of all time. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we're going to need to do here, comrades, is burn some honey. So let's go ahead and transfer some honey into a saucepan that we will place over medium heat. And in case you're keeping score at home, I'm using a wildflower honey, but I have to think pretty much any honey is going to work in this. And I know I just said we're going to burn the honey, but that's not really true. All right, all we're really going to do is cook this until it's like one shade darker and sort of takes on the aroma of caramel, or as I pronounced it all my life, caramel. And yes, it is insane I'm using a pan this small because it is probably going to foam up and you do not want this boiling over on your stove. So you go ahead and use something a little deeper. But anyway, I went ahead and cooked mine for about 10 minutes or so, until like I said, it kind of darkened up a bit, and I started smelling that distinct aroma of caramelized sugar. And then once we've pushed that as far as we want to go, what we'll do is turn off the heat and whisk in a little splash of cold, fresh water, which will immediately stop this from cooking any further, plus make the texture a little bit thinner once it cools. And then once that's set, we'll push it to the back of the stove, and we'll place a large metal bowl over our lowest heat setting, into which we will toss a whole bunch of butter. And for the record, this bowl is supposed to be placed over simmering water and not directly on the flame. But just like when I make hollandaise, I like to live dangerously. And as long as we have a really, really low heat setting, this will be fine. And then to the butter, we will also add a touch of white sugar, as well as some of our recently burned honey, plus some regular honey. And then what we'll do to this is absolutely nothing. We will simply let it sit there until our butter melts. And while we're waiting, what we should do is take some baking soda, not powder, baking soda, and add some salt to it as well as some cinnamon, because we're going to be tossing that in in a few minutes. And then what we'll do once our butter melts, or almost melts, is go ahead and give this a whisk and leave it over the heat until it's very warm to the touch. All right, not super hot and not just barely warm. And then what we'll do once that is very warm to the touch is go ahead and add six cold eggs. And we'll go ahead and whisk those in. And relax, this is not so hot that it's gonna scramble those eggs. Which reminds me, if your eggs scramble, it was too hot. And what we'll do once our eggs have been mixed in is simply keep this over that very low heat setting until the entire mixture comes back to that very warm temperature. And sure, a temperature would help here, but you're not getting one. You have to learn to use the force and your fingertips. And then what we'll do as soon as that mixture does feel very warm again, is go ahead and stir in our baking soda cinnamon mixture. And you'll see just after a few minutes of stirring, the mixture is going to change color and get much lighter and it will sort of look thick and foamy. And that's because of all those little tiny bubbles that the baking soda is producing. And then once that's been stirred in and our mixture is hopefully looking a little something like this, we will remove that from the heat into some better light. And we'll go ahead and finish this up by sifting in some all-purpose flour, which we generally don't want to do all at once. So what we'll do is sift this in two or three additions. And as soon as one addition has been stirred in, we will add the next. And once all that flour has been added and stirred in, we should be looking at a somewhat thick, but still fairly runny and easily spreadable batter. So that is looking just about perfect right there. And then what we'll do to form our layers of honey cake is transfer just shy of about half a cup onto the Silpat line baking sheet. And then using ideally an offset spatula, we want to spread this out into about an eight or nine inch circle. And since I have like zero cake making utensils and tools, I just spread mine out using a rubber spatula. But if you Google offset spatula, you'll see what you're supposed to use. And yes, as you can tell from the dirty silpat, I actually did a few before I filmed this one. But don't worry, this one came out just as bad. And then what we'll do once that's set is give it a quick shake and then the old tapa tapa to knock out any big air bubbles. At which point we're gonna cook this at 375 for about six to seven minutes, or until it looks like this. And that's it, we only have to do that seven more times. Which is why it's an advantage to have more than one pan and one silpat. And no, my oven didn't magically clean that silpat while it was baking. This was a shot from the other pan I was using. And the shot just happened to be a lot better. But anyway, what we'll wanna do as soon as that comes out of the oven 
is very carefully slided off the pan and onto the table, which is going to allow it to cool a lot faster. And then after about six or seven minutes, it should be cool enough and firm enough to remove from the mat. And by the way, even though the surface looks pretty smooth, you'll see as I flip this upside down onto this piece of parchment, underneath you will have some spots where bubbles have formed. But do not worry about those. As you'll see, that's not going to cause any problem. And you should be pretty shocked if each layer does not have a few of those. But anyway, I went ahead and did seven more of those, stacking them up with parchment paper between the layers as I went. But I stopped stacking at three, because as you can see in this shot, those first few I piled up sort of stuck to the paper, because this is a relatively sticky cake because of the honey. So I stopped stacking those, and just ended up spreading them out on the table like this. And then once all your layers are totally cooled, we can take a plate, in my case a paper plate, and trim around them making sure they're all the same size. And not to brag, but all mine were really close. But even so, I did grab my pizza wheel, and I went around so they all had a beautiful, nice, clean edge. But anyway, that's optional. Although if you do it, save the scraps, since we can actually add those to the crumb mixture with which we're going to coat our cake. And if you're wondering what crumb mixture, well, the crumb mixture we're going to make with the extra batter. Since if everything goes according to plan, after you've done your eight layers, you should have just about this much batter left which we will just spread out onto our baking sheet. And we will cook that for about 10 minutes, at which point we'll go ahead and cut this up into smaller pieces. And the whole reason for this is if we left it whole, I think those outside edges might get too dark and possibly burnt, and not burnt honey burnt, like actually burnt. So by making what's basically cake croutons, I think this is all gonna cook a lot more evenly. So we will cut, toss, and go ahead and pop that back in for about maybe seven to 10 minutes more, or until fairly well browned. And by the way, we can also do that with any of our trimmings from earlier. And that's it, once that's all cooled, we can go ahead and give it the old bag and bash until we have some fairly fine crumbs. And then once that's set, we can move on to the last major component, our creamy filling slash frosting, which we're gonna make in a very cold bowl with a very cold whisk. All right, keep those in the fridge until you're ready to use them. And then into that, we will pour two pints of very cold heavy cream. Okay, when you whip cream, it has to be very cold, especially if you're gonna do it by hand like I do. And of course, go ahead and use your electric beaters if you want. But by doing this by hand, I'm gonna burn off the exact same amount of calories as one slice of cake, give or take 300 calories or so. And what we wanna do here is whip this until we have soft peaks, or what would be a more accurate name, floppy peaks. And then what we'll do once we've achieved those is go ahead and add the rest of our burnt honey, as well as a couple nice big spoons of sour cream, and of course, the regular sour cream to cream ratio is gonna be up to you. But I'm going for a fairly light filling. So I have like four parts cream to one part sour cream. But anyway, we'll go ahead and add that and then continue whisking until we have fairly stiff peaks. All right, we don't wanna to go too far and make butter here, but we do want this mixture getting fairly stiff because it has to hold up all those layers. And when I reach that stage, it looked like this. And that's it, once our cream's done, we can start to assemble. And for this first layer, I went around and trimmed off the parchment right up to the cake, which is gonna give us something to slide our spatulas under. And then we'll go ahead and transfer on a generous cup at least of our whipped cream and spread that out as evenly as we can, almost up to the edge. All right, we don't have to go all the way because the next layer is gonna press it down. And speaking of the next layer, you wanna place a side that has the divots from the air bubbles facing up. That way when we spread on the cream, it's gonna fill in. And of course, as you're putting these on, you're giving them a nice gentle press. But anyway, we'll continue creaming and caking until we have one layer of cake left. And unlike the other ones, this last layer I like to put with the nice side up. So maybe save your smoothest best one for last. And that's it, we'll go ahead and frost the top. And if everything goes according to plan, you should have just enough whipped cream to go around the sides as well, which I barely did. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Just tell people you're doing the rustic version. And you know, there are so many activities involved with cooking that I find very therapeutic. And frosting a cake is way up that list. All right, it just feels really good. And it makes you feel really good. And because of that, while you're doing this, that cake is absorbing all those good feels. Which is why when your guests eat this, they feel good. Or at least that's what I assume happens. But anyway, we'll go ahead and spread over the rest of our whipped cream. And then to finish our cake off, we're going to cover it with our crumbs. And for that, I'm going to use the old ricochet method where we let the crumbs fall against like a bench scraper or a piece of paper like this, and they basically bounce onto the cake and stick onto the whipped cream. 
And personally, I like to go for full coverage, although you do see a lot of versions where just the top is chromed, or just the sides are covered and the top is left white. But anyway, presentation's up to you. I mean, you are for all the Vladimir of your crumb veneer, and it's up to you to decide how you should be putting these on. But anyway, like I said, I like to cover the whole thing, at which point we can do a little bit of cleanup around the base. And then I have some horrible news. We have to refrigerate this overnight or longer to enjoy it in all its glory. And during that time, that whipped cream is going to kind of soak into the layers, and they're going to get even moister and more luscious. So do not try to eat this as soon as you make it. Although if you did, it probably would still be really good. But I did go ahead and pop mine in the fridge overnight. And by the way, I actually did cover it in plastic. I just didn't film that, since this video is so long. And then a day later, I went ahead and pulled it out. At which point I performed the always terrifying maneuver of trying to transfer it onto a cake stand with two wobbly spatulas. But as you can see, that went pretty well. And speaking of things going well, cutting a nice neat first slice out of one of these big cakes is not the easiest thing to do. But much to my surprise, that also worked out better than expected. So I grabbed a fork to go in for a taste. And please note, those toasted crumbs are just not for a garnish. They really do help accentuate that caramelized honey flavor in the cake. And then as far as the cake itself goes, it really is shockingly light in texture, but with a very profound, deep, deep honey flavor. Right, that tiny little amount of bitterness we get from the burnt honey step really is the secret here. And then that slightly tangy whipped cream frosting is just absolutely perfect for this, since not only does it provide a little bit of acidity, and of course a lovely light texture, but unlike most frostings, it is not too sweet. Right, the only thing we used to sweeten that was that little bit of burnt honey. So to summarize, I was very happy with how this came out. And I celebrated by cutting another slice, so I could do a fully food style plate, and then take some pictures. And more importantly, eat some more. But anyway, that's it. My take on Russian honey cake. And no, it's not easy to make. And it does take a lot of time and effort. But it is so, so worth it. And that's coming from someone that doesn't even like cake. So whether you're making this honey cake for your honey's sake, or you're just in the mood for a challenging bake, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below to get the ingredient amounts, the written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.